Hi, this is Chaplain Greg Johnston here with our Walking in the Word series. And uh, if you are enjoying this series, I ask that you please like this video and then subscribe. Uh, that way we can uh, expand the Word of God to more people. So please like and subscribe if you like this video. Last week we talked about the first six days of creation and boy there was a lot there wasn't there. Um, if you missed that please go back and uh, watch it maybe re-watch it over and over again. Um, because what it gives you is a sense of what God was trying to accomplish with this creation because the Bible as we said last week is not a science textbook. And when you start imposing scientific theories into biblical text, I think you really start missing out on what God is trying to tell us. So we went through the first six days and there is a seventh day. So I'm getting out my trusty CSB Bible. And we are going to start in chapter two. And we're going to talk about what the seventh day is. So chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. And on the seventh day, God had completed his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy. For on it, he rested from all the work of creation. All right. The seventh day for the Jewish mind was very important. It was a time of rest or Shabbat, what they call the Sabbath. Think about this. Order has been made out of chaos in the first six days. Everything has been created. God has created this special piece of creation called the human male and female, to reflect his creative nature. Make families, culture, art, music, gardens, all of that stuff. Creation is a holy temple in which God lives with his creation. It's time for him to dwell in that creation with it. Notice on the seventh day that there's no evening and morning. It, the seventh day was designed to last forever. We, as his creation, were designed to live in his presence in the seventh day, enjoying what God had made. This is Shabbat. This is the goal of creation. To rest and to enjoy what God has made. And for the humans to reflect that creative and loving nature of God as being the images of who God is. Let's notice some patterns from these seven different things. Notice, frequently it says, and God said. God said, and then it was. Also, notice, and there was evening and morning. That's how he separated these different sections. There's evening and morning. There's good, things that are pronounced good. And then there's very good. At the end on day six, when everything's done and the humans have made and they received their commission to go out and reflect God to the rest of creation, that is very good. Spaces are created in the first three days, and then the next three days, those spaces are filled. Now, the one thing I want you to notice as we're reading through chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 3, is how many times the number 7 comes up. This is amazing. So, seven days, that's obvious, right? If you read through and you count how many times God counts something as good, seven times. It goes even deeper than that. 
in Hebrew, in the opening verse, Genesis 1-1, seven words. Genesis uh, 1 uh, verse 2, 14 words. So double that amount. All right. Genesis 2, uh, 3, 1 through 3. I'm sorry. Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Ready? 21 words. The number 7 keeps coming up over and over again throughout all of this. The number 7 for the Jewish person, numbers and letters and words are very, very important to the Jewish way of thinking and communicating. And it's a number of perfection. It's a number of completeness. And so 7 is all over this creation narrative, saying that it's perfect, it's complete, it's what God wants. God has separated the chaos, has pushed it aside. He has pushed nothing aside, unordered chaos, which is the Jewish mind of conceiving of what nothing is, pushed it aside and made this beautiful creation in the middle of it. It's something to think about, something to ponder, and uh, you almost hate to move on, but we need to. We need to move on. And we're going to go into the next creation story. Now we're going to get into a little bit more detail. And it's also interesting how the language changes quite a bit from the first creation story to the second creation story. The first creation story is a song. Think about it. It's a poem. It has meter. It has a structure to it. The second creation story is also very much poem-like, but in a different way. See, the, the tradition is, is that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy. And that is probably largely true. I, I largely agree with that. But I'm sure he had other folks helping him write this down. And we also know that these five books went through a lot of editing and uh, putting together during the time of the exile in Babylon. So these authors who put this to these editors and the authors that put all this together, they're trying to tell us something in their way of saying things back then. Remember what I said earlier in an earlier video. The Bible is not written for us. It's written to us. So it's worth it to take time into understanding what these folks meant when they were writing these words down. So let's go to chapter 2. Verses 4 through 24. And this is the creation of humanity in detail. Again, we start with a purposeless, chaotic nothing. But this time, this time, it's described differently. And if you look at chapter 2, verse 4, it starts, These are the records of the heavens and the earth concerning their creation. At the time that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, no shrub of the field had yet grown in the land. No plant of the field had yet sprouted from the Lord, had the, for the Lord had not made it rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. All right? What is he describing here? He's describing kind of a desert, isn't he? That was the other way that the Jewish person would think of nothing. Um, when I was in Israel and I looked out over the desert of Zin, yes, there were lots of rocks. There were these little nasty little lizards running around. But largely, it was nothing. It was desolate. It reminded me, if I were to be dropped in there without any water, you know, it wouldn't take long for me to become nothing. Um, so the desert is another way for the Jewish person to think about 
or try to describe what nothing is. Now, notice that the name for God is changed in, in the first chapter, in the first creation story, he's referred to as Elohim, okay? Which is the plural of God or heavenly beings. Interesting, huh? Plural. But now you see Lord, L-O-R-D, all in capital letters. What does that mean? Well, when we get into the Torah, especially when we talk about Exodus, we're going to talk about the name Yahweh and how that is the formal name for God. So Yahweh is now used instead of Elohim. I'm not going to read all of this chapter, but I'm just going to kind of summarize for you what you look at. And I encourage you, read chapter 2 and 3 over the next week. Again, several different versions. It's worth it. The arrival of the human. The human was formed from the dust or the nismat or the exhale and was given human life. The human becomes a person. This is a reference to the image of God through God's nisma or through his breath, through his breathing into the human. So, also, just also talked about here is the geography of creation. So think about this. There was the garden towards the east in Eden. It's the garden in Eden, not the garden of Eden. Remember that. There's a garden towards the east in Eden. The human is placed in the garden. And there's two trees. A great word study. If you're ever wanting to do a word study, do one on trees. Fascinating stuff. Anyways, two trees in the garden. There's the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. More to come on these trees. So you have a garden in the east. One river flows out of the garden and then forms four rivers. North, south, east, and west. When you put this together, what do you have? It's an image of the temple. Because in the temple or in the tabernacle, you had the Holy of Holies, and then you had the holy space, and then surrounding it, you had the, the temple curtains. This is very intentional because the tree of life is meant to be a reflection of God's presence. And the life that the humans received was from God's presence. The tree of life reflected God's presence in this garden. And the human's job was to increase and expand this garden throughout all creation. The human's job is to cultivate, grow, expand, tend the garden. The human was to bring blessings to the rest of creation. It's the same verbiage, the same way of describing how the trees, how the priests work in the tabernacle or the temple. The human could not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, as it would bring death. More on that later. That's a really important point that's going to, unfortunately, cause the downfall. Now, in verses 18 through 24, God realized, shouldn't say realized, the scripture talks about how the human needs company. So God created the animals, and the human was to give the animals names. So... Giving a creature a name gives them identity. So he would say, here's a giraffe, Mr. Giraffe, Mrs. Giraffe. Here is a porcupine, Mr. Porcupine, Mrs. Porcupine. 
the human needed an azer. The human, as a single being, was insufficient. The human needed an azer. Now, this is, I think, poorly translated in our English versions. Because the word helpmate is usually used. And that, that indicates some subordination. A helpmate means that it's sort of a tag-along to help you out. And that's not the word, that's not what the word azer really means. Azer in Hebrew is what most English versions translate as helpmate. I think the Bible Project gets it correct when they say a great translation of azer is delivering ally. It's a term of equality, not subordination. So the human needed a delivering ally, somebody to come alongside the human in order to do the work that needed to be done. As a single entity, the human couldn't do it. The human needed to be a dual entity. And what does that mean? I'm getting a little bit strange here. I know, I know this isn't the common way of thinking about it, but I think when you get into the language of the ancient Jew, this starts to make more sense. So the, the common way of thinking is that Adam, a male human, was put to sleep and a part of him, a rib, was taken and Eve was created. Let me put it in a different way. The human was put to sleep and the term taking a rib is kind of the same term as splitting into two. So the human was split into two equal parts, male and female. The female is to be called the woman because she was taken out of the human. Okay. The joining of male and female in marriage, and it talks about that in this portion of scripture, is a reuniting of that one flesh. Notice also that it says that they were naked and not ashamed of their nudity because all they knew was good. They didn't know what evil was. They didn't know anything but God's goodness. So let's recap here. The human as a single entity was insufficient and needed to be split into two, into two equal parts, masculine and feminine. The human needed a delivering ally in order to do the work that God had set them to. God had given the humans a purpose of reflecting his creative, loving image to the rest of creation and being fruitful and multiplying throughout that creation. The garden is a type of tabernacle or temple holding the life-sustaining presence of God, the creator, and the humans are a type of a priest taking God's blessing of his presence into the rest of creation. Now, I'm going to let you sit on that for a week, but read chapter 2 from verse 4 on, and also read chapter 3 this week, uh, as many versions as you can. And uh, think about that. So this is uh, Chaplain Greg, Wandering Wesleyan. If you like this video, please uh, like it and then subscribe. And uh, we'll talk next week. And uh, as much as this has been a happy talk, next week will be kind of a sad talk. So have a great week. Be blessed. Take care.